Latour. Dr. Jane, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to, to be here. Please give the listeners a little background. Where do you live and what do you do? Okay, so I live in Seattle, Washington. I started out in Pennsylvania and went to college and grad school in Midwest. And now I'm in Seattle and next stop is Hawaii as far as I'm concerned. So which <laughs> island? Um, you know, I love Maui because the sand, but the big island has this particular feel about it. It's a very kind of like you feel the land when you're on the big island. So I try to balance between the two. Not a bad life. Right. <laughs> uh, before we get started, something you shared with me, what do you want to be known as? Oh, yes. So someone called me this once and I decided that I'm going to take it on. Uh, she said, so you're a brain, brain geek and a self-love expert. And I went, oh, that's exactly what I am. It's exactly what I am. I mean, I love geeking out on, you know, the wonderful thing about being ther in therapy now is that now we know why what we do works with all the brain science and all the scans. Now we go, oh, of course this method works because this is what's happening in your brain. So I love, and what I also found is that the more we understand how our brain naturally works, the more compassion we have for how we naturally think. And it gives us brain hacks for, okay, so this is how my brain works. How do I want it to work? What can I do to switch my brain's natural proclivity to what actually makes me feel good and motivates me more? So I love what you touched on there. And it's something that I preach about is I feel a lot of people have quote fallen asleep. Mm -hmm. People are living life by default rather than by design. And if you understood the power of your mind and your thoughts and emotions, what you can create. So do you want to yes. touch on that? Yeah, absolutely. So any part you especially want to uh, go towards? Well, probably not to get too deep and too technical, but a high level overview, what is this kind of whole brain science? And, and if you understand the mind, how can you kind of like take back control and get in the driver's seat? Okay, awesome. So the, the first thing that I tell, um, I don't know if I mentioned I am a psychotherapist, <laughs> so I see clients, but the first thing I tell my clients to give them some compassion, because everybody's coming in because they aren't happy with who they are. They're stressed and they don't think they're enough. They're not doing enough. They're not good enough. They're just not enough, right? And so I say to them, oh, your brain's set up for that. Like I, I first heard this concept of the brain is Velcro for negative and Teflon for positive by doc, from Dr. Rick Hansen. I think I've read all his books and they're awesome. They're super great for helping you cultivate self-compassion. And so the brain, there's a thought that the ego is based in the, um, the uh, neocortex, the newest part of our brain, right? Um, and there's thought that the ego is based there and that research has shown that when we are not actively engaged, like all, you know, we're in that flow state, our attention's just totally there, we're in the moment, we're good, right? When we're not in that state, which we hardly ever are, our neocortex is searching for problems, searching for what's wrong, searching for things to find, right? Problems to find and to fix. Except the neocortex never fixes them. It's just like, there's a problem. There's a problem. Do you see that problem? There's a potential problem. Have you thought about that? That might be an issue. So our brains are constantly doing that. So I just read a study that came out in 2020 that said we have an average of 6,200 thoughts a day. I'd previously read 50 to 70,000, so it's a lot smaller, but it's still a lot of thoughts a day, right? And most of our thoughts are negative and most of our thoughts are repetitive. That's how our brain is naturally set up. So when people come in and like, I just keep thinking the same thing over and over again, I'm like, yeah, because you've got a human brain. Question, to not yeah. get too technical because I'm not an expert in this field, it is something I study. Are you talking about our different brain waves, beta, alpha? Um, well, I wasn't directly, but you're absolutely right that most of us run in high beta, which is the kind of frenzied, um, Fight or stressed flight. out. Yeah. And our brains are most happy, I think, from what I understand, when we're in alpha. 
because the alpha waves connect our whole brain together, right? And they're, they're our calm focus. Beta is like problem solving and it's active thinking and it's great, but we don't want to spend all our time in there. And most of us are in beta or high beta versus think, alpha, which is super awesome. Well, and that's what I call monkey mind. When you're feeling that internal chaos and anxiety, yes. that's what, you know, how many people have anxiety these days? It's because you're stuck in this analytical mind and okay so now how how do you calm the chaos and get into this alpha or even sometimes theta just drop right. into ease and right. flow how do you do that well um one of the fastest hacks i know and that i use a lot because i've got adhd right so my brain's in actually my brain's in delta which is my brain's asleep like delta waves are what we run when we're sleeping or we have adhd so so my brain needs help. So I listen to alpha wave music. Like literally, I just, when I have to focus, I put, I go to YouTube, type in alpha wave music and have it on. And it's lovely. And my brain lights up. I can think, I can focus. I'm, I calm down naturally. So that's a really super hack that anybody can do. Um, the second thing is um, I was just reading the book, The Body Keeps the Score, which is an awesome but intense book about trauma, right? And, and different therapies for working with people in trauma. And one of the things he said is that the left frontal cortex is the seat of our executive functioning, which is, I gotta figure stuff out. I gotta make a plan, set up the steps. We're gonna make this work, right? That's when we're trying to problem solve, right? But the most of our negative emotions, maybe I'm not quite sure if it's all our emotional feelings or just the negative ones. They're in the limbic system, which is in the back of the brain. That's the amygdala is there also. And it's where that's when we're like, oh, God, this feels awful. Oh, something's terribly wrong. Oh, no, what's going to happen? But there are literally no connections between the left prefrontal cortex, the decision making, action taking part of the brain with the limbic system, the, the emotional part. So when we're trying to problem solve our way out of stress, there's no connection. Like we aren't doing anything. We're just keeping the cycle going. However, the medial frontal cortex is the center of our awareness, our self-awareness. So when we pay attention and go, wow, I feel awful right now. So what's happening in my body? Oh, my chest is all tight. Wow, my heart's beating really fast. When we literally have that self-awareness, activate that medial frontal cortex, that does have connections in the brain to our limbic system. And therefore our brain can process the feelings, sort them, assign them to the right parts of the brain, and then they can be really processed and released. But thinking about them doesn't do anything. Is Well, for sure, because that's where the problem started, right? You can't solve right? a problem with the same th thought that created it. And that's what exactly. I think most people get so stuck in. I've done it. The analytical right. mind. I gotta, I gotta solve. I gotta, I gotta do. And that's what I call mm -hmm. manic manifesting when you're trying to make things happen. Right. Oh, but I goodness. also feel, do you believe as a society, we are conditioned to be doing this? Absolutely. When you think about um, when you were a little kid, like, I don't know if you heard this, but I heard, and most little kids did is like, well, stop. You can't be hungry. It's not dinner time. Or come on, eat, it's dinner time. Or come on, go to bed, it's time, time for bed, but I'm not tired. I don't care, it's bedtime, go to bed. We're taught with all these messages, super subtle, not bad. It's just like, you know, our parents want us to just follow the program and just do what they want them to do, right? So we're taught with those to separate our head from our body. We're taught, don't pay attention to your body, listen to what I say, do what I say, right? And we're, we're rewarded if we do that, we're not rewarded if we pay attention to our body and my body's like, but I'm hungry now, but I don't want to get up, right? So in order to, you know, get along with the family, because we're, you know, pack animals, we just say, okay, I will not pay attention to my body because clearly it's not, it's not helping me here. So I'm just going to be in my head, right? So we lose this vast amount of information that's in our body. When we just pay attention to that thinking, the head part. You just made me realize with that analogy that cutting that off, isn't that how all trapped emotion is started? 
right? That mm -hmm. I, I've been told or heard in research that chronic pain in the body is trapped emotion. Yeah. So if we're always suppressing, oh, right. that doesn't feel right, or listening to ourselves, then it's like that shuts down. Exactly. Hmm. Yep. Yep. We shut down our bodies. Like one of the, I developed a feelings model one time when I was, uh, I'll tell you the story of how I developed my feelings model. We were, uh, I mean, I had scheduled massage with somebody who had, was offering massage packages and massages at that time weren't something I gave to myself much because I didn't feel worthy of them. I should spend my money on more important stuff like quotes around important. So a friend was offering at, uh, you know, half price and went, great, I'll buy three. I'll help her. I'll help me and I'll save money. Awesome. And then um, about six months went by and I was like, oh, I wonder when that massage package ex expires because I had two left. And so I texted her and I said, when's that package up? She's like, next week. I'm like, oh no. So I went on her schedule. I couldn't find any spaces that I could get into. And I'm like, crap, I lost that money. What is wrong with me? Why did I make that? You know, why did I do that? I shouldn't have done it. You know, you shouldn't have done that. Well, well, no, she should, she should have let me know the package was up. She shouldn't have, she shouldn't have just let me lose it. And so I was going back and forth and then going, oh, Jane, stop being pissed about it. It's just, so I was, what I was noticing is I was trying to repress the feelings or I was like feeding them going, oh, well, I should feel this way because she did something wrong or I did something wrong where I just stopped. All of a sudden, I, was, I remember where I was, I was in my kitchen and I went, I'm angry and I don't want to feel it. Because in my family, feeling anger was not a safe thing to do, right? So I'm like, okay, so I'm angry. I felt it in my body. So I just sat down on my couch and I just felt angry. I literally paid attention to what was happening in my body. And five minutes later, it was gone. Okay, so that's a powerful message because right? you're right. We repress, we don't want to feel, and then we numb out and all the ways that we numb exactly. out. But five and we minutes. don't, we're, we're numbing out. But as you said, it's, we're sticking it in there. It can't be processed out. Like our feelings literally are when we have a reaction to something, our body's natural process is done with anywhere between 90 seconds to two minutes. Like the neurochemical response is done. It's like getting the chemicals out there, processing, done. But with our repressing, which is keeping it stuck, or our feeding, which just keeps feeding it. So even if we're processing it, we just add more neurochemicals to keep it going. Um, so if, if we let our feelings do their job, which is simply to be felt, it can be done in two minutes. Now, self-compassion note, I've never gotten faster than five minutes, like never, because I'm like, well, I shouldn't feel it. Oh, okay, no, just feel it. Well, they shouldn't, have, uh, no, just feel it. So I just noticed my brain trying to rationalize, trying not to feel both those repressing and, and feeding is just our attempt not to feel what's a difficult thing to feel. So we ironically keep it around longer. Or I think what it sounds like you're saying is trying to justify. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes total yep. sense. I even, yep. I had a scenario just this morning talking perfect timing mm -hmm. and um, I sent a, a text to a group, part of my mastermind. We're reading this at attachment theory book. I think it's BS. I shared that with right. them. <laughs> well, it just like, I don't know. I think it holds people to plain victim, but anyway, and, and one of their responses totally like my, my knee jerk reaction was to be defensive. And I was like, right. Whoa, why am I being defensive? And then, you know, hours went by and I'm going to the gym and I'm still trying to find evidence of why I'm right. it. it's like, why do we put ourselves through this mess? Exactly. But our brain naturally does that. That's the neocortex. Mm -hmm. It's just, this is what we do. And it takes that intentional focus and awareness to go, wait a minute, I'm going to stop this. Yeah. Or let me just either just feel it or how do I want to think about this? What's, how do I choose to think about this? So I don't go to victim. I don't go to rationalization. I don't go to justification. justification. It's just like, wow, that response hurt, period. And then we're done. Uh, you move on. Exactly. But that's, that a lot, that's emotional intelligence to be able to be self-aware, to mm -hmm. feel it, acknowledge it, whatever, and move on. Yeah, it is. And it comes with practice. 
okay. it, it's available for everybody and it comes with practice, a lot of practice. <laughs> Well, and that's why I believe this is all such a process for all of us. It's a journey. And something I really want you to dive into is, is what you love and are about, which is self-compassion and changing yeah. our words and our thoughts. And you go down that route. Awesome. Well, I don't know if um, I sent you the book. I wrote a book, Everything's Perfect, Just Not Me, uh, a roadmap for self-acceptance, right? Because I, there are tools that I give all my clients that I want everybody to have. Because when we can act with more self-compassion, we, when we have more compassion for ourselves and our humanness, our human foibles, then we can have compassion for literally everybody else, right? So the more we act with compassion with ourselves, the more we spread that compassion in the world. I just have to tell you something real quick. And in order for me to wrap my head around this, something mm -hmm. I told my mom recently was like, I am going to start treating everybody because we are having a human experience. Yes. I'm going to treat everybody as though they are a five-year-old having a temper tantrum. Right. And I love them. I am not judging them. I am, I'm just holding safe space. Mm-hmm to let them know, like to feel it and get through it. But we're all, if we thought of everyone or the other one I kind of like is having dementia, it's like, we forget who we yeah. are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's just one way I've been going about it, but I, I would love to more know more about what is your process and how do you teach this? Okay. Well, one of the first things I tell everybody um, within the first four sessions is if I were queen of the world, I would ban the word should must, have to, need, and for Midwesterners, gotta. And I'll explain why. So, and this is because it's super helpful. Our body gives us so much information and most of us, you know, don't pay attention to our body. Um, what I have people do, and we, we, are you willing to do an experiment with me? I'm in. Awesome, great. Okay, so is there something you should, to, you should do, or you have to do, or you need to do? Like that right you've been now. avoiding? Um, should. Well, I finally did it right before this call, but I, I had set out fall decorations and it was just sitting there. And I was like, I should put that away. I need to put that away. Okay, great. So if, if it's in the past, we'll see how it works. Anyway, okay. so say I should put out my fall decorations or put it, would you say put it away? Let's do the gym. I should, okay. I should work out. I should go awesome. to the gym. Great. Okay. So say it again. I should I go to the gym. I should go to the gym. Close your eyes. And what are you feeling your body? it's very tight in my chest. Right. Yeah. Anywhere else? Anything else you notice? Mm, I mainly feel in my chest. In your mirror. Great. Okay. So great. Now open your eyes and say, it's a good idea to go to the gym. It's a good idea to go to the gym. Uh huh. Close your eyes. And what do you notice? Um, it's an interesting feeling in my stomach. Hmm. Sort of like butterfly, just more joy or ease. Interesting. And what's happening in your chest? Mm, it's not as tight. Isn't that interesting? Great. So beautiful. Thank you. And I hope everybody listening to the podcast did that too, because we only do things, our ego only says, yeah, go ahead. If it can tell it works. Otherwise we're like, oh, that's not going to work. That's too simple or that's too hard. Or So our ego automatically finds problems. So I always have people do it. So their body can tell them if it works for them or not. And this works for everybody. So anyway, so what you did basically is you said the same thing, like go to the gym, right? That's both ways. But when we use the word should, must, have to, and need, we are feeding ourselves the message. You have to, you have no choice. And if you should be doing it and you haven't done it already, what is wrong with you? You're failing because if you should do it, it should have been done. So what are you waiting for? What's wrong with you? Yeah. So even when we do it, we're, we don't get the, the dopamine hit of, yay me, I did it. It's more like, well, finally, it's about time. So we get no reward for this behavior, which is something we actually, it's on our list for a reason. I mean, like we exercise because it actually is good for us, right? It is a good idea. And it feels so good. You, yeah, it feels good. So when you say it's a good idea or it'd be helpful, you're seeding your subconscious. One, you're not triggering that, that, oh no, I don't, I don't, no, I don't, no, I shouldn't, uh, right? It's like we become like two when we hear those words. But we, when we say it'd be helpful or a good idea, 
we uh, trigger our subconscious to say, oh, well, if it's a good idea, well, when will I have time? Well, I've got a space between clients between three and five, I'll go then. So we're literally seeding our unconscious to do the work for us mm. to find out if it's a good idea, how do we do it then? So it, it's less work actually when we use those words. One, we get rid of the physical resistance. So not only do we have to do this thing, but we have to push through the resistance to do the thing versus, oh, yeah, it's a good idea. Okay, and then it's easier to do. Is that, am I clear on how I'm explaining that? I mean, it makes sense to me and it's really just rephrasing. And so if you are yes. pay attention to the words that make you feel good, oh, that'd mm-hmm. be a good idea. It's more like, oh, that's an interesting thought versus a force. Nobody wants to be forced to do anything. Nobody does. A word you brought up that I think is very powerful and something to dive into because we're both into um, Abraham Hicks, Uh resistance. And most people experience a lot of resistance and, you know, aren't where they want to be. Right. Yeah. So one of the, I think a lot of the resistance, my own personal philosophy is a lot of our resistance is to what is, right? There's a guy, it's either Jeff Foster or Jeff Brown, who said, um, hell is wanting the present moment to be different, right? So when we're fighting against what is, all our energy is going, well, it shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't, you know, like our resisting our feelings. I shouldn't have these feelings. The gym should be open on hours that are easier for me. You know, all this stuff. Traffic shouldn't be this way. We're spending all our time arguing against like what is out there that we don't come to our internal sense and go, well, how do I want to respond? Here's what's happening. How do I want to respond? One of the models I use, and I give this to all my clients too, is originally from Stephen Covey, Covey, you know, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I've changed the names because the, when I gave his names, it confused my clients. So I, won, I, I changed it. So basically, when we're anxious about something, we're in one of what well, we're in two, we could be in two places. One, the inside circle, imagine a smaller circle inside of a bigger circle. The inside circle is our circle of power. That's what we actually have some semblance of power over. And that is our thoughts and our behaviors. Like, Those are ours. We can't blame them on anybody else. We can't give them to anybody else. They are ours. They are our center of power, right? Everything else is in that outside, I call circle of control or victim, right? It's the traffic, it's the weather, it's the gym hours. It's the, I'm, I'm so tired because I, you know, the cats kept me up last night or, you know, whatever. So anytime we're anxious, helpless, hopeless, stuck, we're in that circle of control or victim. We're arguing against what is. So when, when my clients are there, I'm like, where are you? And they go, I'm in the circle of control. And I'm like, okay, come to the circle of power. Is there anything you can do about it? If so, what? And if you've tried and it hasn't worked, then how do you choose to be with this situation? Because we can't always choose the situation we're in. We can always choose how we respond. That's always our power. And then our response, I don't tell my clients this right away, but our response changes the situation, right? We can't do it to change the situation. Like, oh, I'm going to change their mind. It's like, no, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be in my power. And then everybody else is like, oh, well, well, that makes sense the way you're doing it. Because we're in our power, just not being defensive. We're just like, well, this is my, this is what's true for me. So I love what you said there. And actually in the beginning of quarantine in this whole 2020 year, right? I did, I, I did a virtual talk on about how to focus on what you can control. Yeah. Because whether it's 2020 or some other life event, we are going right. to come up against challenges and obstacles. Mm-hmm. And if you come from a mindset space of, you know, life is happening to me and and I'm, you put the blame externally and it's the environment. It's my boss. It's whoever Mm -hmm. you're screwed. You're screwed. You're stuck. You've got no power. You've just given away all your power. But you're right. I love this small circle and I, I, I drew my own picture, but if you come back to in any situation, what can you control? And it's only you. Yeah. That's the only, and we think, we think we have control or can change other people. It's BS. And I've 
you know, we could talk about being conditional. I think that's a mm-hmm. huge one that tra- traps a lot of people. Mm-hmm. You know, if he does this, then I'll be happy. Really? Right? If you're happy, uh, then he might do that thing. Right now. <laughs> it's funny how that works that way. Right? Yeah. 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 Because nobody else wants to be told what to do any more than we do. Like when we go around shooting or needing, you need to do this for me. It's like, their ego is responding exactly the same as ours do. We create resistance and we actually make it harder for them to do, if they want to, the thing we want them to do. We're actually making it harder for them. Something else that you talk about, and I would love for you to share, which is your credo. Oh, yes. Oh, thank you. I love my credo. This kind of came to me. I was in a, I was in a, um, a huge hotel meeting room at a, at a workshop. And this just kind of like downloaded. And I'm like, this is, this is my credo for my work and my life. So here's what came out. When people love themselves, they don't judge others. The more they love themselves, the better boundaries they have. They teach others love by example, not by telling or shooting. People who love themselves show others what is possible. Kindness, love, acceptance, and forgiveness. I want that for you, me, and everyone we meet. And if we all showed up that way, what amazing, <gasps> amazing change we would experience. Right? Yeah. And also a lot of self-compassion because we're all hurting. We're all those hurting five-year-olds, right? We all have that in us and we all respond in our little hurting five-year-old self. And then, you know, we, we can have compassion and go, oh, wow, I'm really hurting right now. And then bring our brain back on board with our self-compassion and awareness, brings our brain back on board, fear, stress, shuts it off. And then we can go, oh, wow, I'm really hurting. Wow. And then we can come back to our compassionate adult self and act from our circle of power. We're like, well, how do I want to respond now? How do I want to either be with myself or the other person or the world? Question, because it just dawned on me. How would somebody take that example and instead of playing victim, oh, I'm hurting, they hurt me, and mm-hmm. sitting and sulking it, how do you step into being self-aware, acknowledging it, and moving on? Because I, I feel like that could go either way. Right, yeah, exactly. So Tara Brock does something just lovely. She basically, when, we're, when we feel we're hurting, when we're paying attention and going, oh, I am not a happy camper right now whether it's our own thoughts or somebody else's actions that really, that we are taking. Usually what's happening is when somebody does something, we're taking it personally and we're making it about our value. And somebody said a quote once that I just love. They said, um, how somebody treats you is about them. How you respond is about you. So one of my favorite responses is by Tara Brock. And she literally puts both of her hands on her heart and it activates the heart center, right? We've got more neurons in our heart and our gut than our brain. So we activate the heart center, just pay attention and feel what's happening in your body and go, oh, I'm hurting with your hands on your heart and just be there. And we can always be with ourselves, even when others can't be with us the way we dearly wish they could or or dearly wish they would because they're doing their own five-year-old hurt kid thing. We can be with ourselves and go, oh, I'm sorry, you're hurting. I'm here with you. Like we can literally always be there for ourselves when, when our brain comes back on board. And that putting your hands on your heart and feeling your body is you being with yourself. That is self-care. Just as much as a massage or you know pedicure that people love, but literally sitting with ourselves as we're feeling go, oh, yeah, this hurts. That is so self-compassionate. I love Don't that. We all want that. Well, and from your credo, what, and, and something I use often is because I am very much into metaphors and I need visualizations to understand things, but I like to think of an example as being the lighthouse for others. Mm-hmm. And if I practice what I preach yes. and if, you know, it's that whole treat others, how you want to be treated, but from your mm-hmm. credo, how can we step back into our power and start being the light? Right. In my opinion, or from what I know, we're often, we hate that in others, which we hate in ourselves. 
right? We only judge others in others what is reflected that we don't want to see in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like the people we most despise have something about them that either we hate about ourselves or we don't allow for ourselves. What do you mean you're playing? What do you mean you played hooky from work? You have to work hard versus me. That's actually me saying, I really want to do that. Why can't I do it? How come you can do that and I can't, right? We put ourselves victim, right? Mm -hmm. But when we embrace, oh, wow, I'm feeling really petty. I'm totally judging them because they took a day off just because they wanted to. Wow, isn't that interesting? So curiosity is a great way to be with those feelings and those thoughts and those aspects of ourselves. We were taught to see less than lovable. Mm -hmm. We're all capable. I believe we're all capable of great evil and we're all capable of great love. And Which to, do you choose? Exactly. But if we repress the capability of evil, we're, you know, that's kind of like, you know, I don't know if you remember back in the, I can't remember if it was the 90s or 2000s, like all these um, pastors like started, they kept catching them with prostitutes, you know, like these pastors with huge congregations, thou shalt not be evil. And they had affairs with prostitutes, right? When they were married. And I'm like, but I mean, it didn't make any sense to me. I'm like, but you're preaching that you're kind and good and you don't lie. And you don't, you're preaching that. So, how, and this is my opinion. I've not spoken with any of them personally, but it is my opinion because they could not allow any weakness, any less than goodness, quote goodness, that it came up. Jung always said in a, someday I'm going to actually get the quote because mine is a just very interesting translation of it but when we don't pay attention to what is the bad in our subconscious it comes up to bite us in the butt right mm -hmm. so when we go oh wow i'm really jealous i'm really hating that person right now but we sit there with compassion we don't act on it but we go wow i am not feeling like a good person right i'm not feeling kind i'm not there's no compassion in me right now that moment of awareness and holding our heart brings us back to compassion. It's a forgiving ourselves for being human because we all make stupid mistakes and we all make lovely gestures. Are you familiar with Ho'oponopono? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That just yeah. made me think of it because Ho'oponopono, for those of you that don't know, I'm, I'm not going to go into it. It's an ancient Hawaiian tradition, but it's, it's to come back to and, and to forgive yourself. I'm sorry. Yes. I love you. Please forgive me. Thank you. And yes. it's those four sentences, those um, statements, declaring, mm -hmm. and oh, uh, so Ho'oponopono, that's... Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, he did research that when he said that over people's files, not even to the psychiatric clients, you know, who were in a psychiatric hospital, they got better. They had fewer behavior problems. They needed less medication. So it's, it's powerful. Yes. Another one I, I love that I got from my friend, Rebecca Gould, uh, her book, um, Detox Your Life, which is super awesome. It's, I love you. I forgive you. I release you. Ooh, right? Except to release. Right, to release. Except I've mod mod modified it because I'm human. And when I'm doing it, it's because I'm wanting to release. I'm wanting to forgive, but I'm not quite there yet. So what I'm saying is, I love you. Because that's always true. I want to forgive you. I want to release you. And I'm just saying what's actually true for me versus... I release you. And then inside I'm like, no, you're not, you're not really. I haven't. Why well, you keep saying this if you've released them. Right. So it's like, I want to forgive you and I want to release you. Mm -hmm. So we can go, we have our intentions and we put our focus there versus beating ourselves up. Cause we haven't done this thing yet. We aren't, we aren't compassionate. Oh my God. What's wrong with me? Why am I not being compassionate with, you know, that helps create compassion. <laughs> I think you dropped some good bombs there. And, and those are words that I try to be so conscious of is right? being intentional and mm -hmm. self-love. And yeah. Yeah, because I, I just feel it starts within. So if we yes, always. Can work on internal, then our external reality changes. Yes, exactly. Okay. How we show up for others. And what I think is happening when we have that self-compassion is we're allowing more of us. So we allow more of others, like mm -hmm. their foibles and their gifts. And when we allow our foibles, we at the same time, miraculously in my mind, we accept our gifts more. When we reject our weaknesses, we also 
reject our gifts. We don't allow our gifts to like to receive them. Well, I have a question for you because we, yeah. we've touched on so many subjects. What is a key takeaway you want listeners to get from our conversation? Uh, be kind to yourself. You're human, just like everybody else. Yes. Is that something, do you practice this in a morning meditation or do you journal? Like, how do you, because, you know, for me, it's like lifting weights. You have to be Absolutely. consistent. You don't have to be, but it sure is helpful. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's honestly, I mean, I am so lucky that I'm a therapist because I get to practice this for hours a day, mm -hmm. right? Every client, I am practicing these tools, every client. But I also have a practice in the morning and evening, like before I get out of bed and in bed, before I go to sleep, I have a gratitude practice mm -hmm. or some people like the word appreciation better. And I just, and for me, because I'm a perfectionist, I used to make lists and I would judge my list. Like, really? You can't think of something new? Well, that's not a big deal. Why are you thankful for that? Really? You mentioned your cats again. So I, I would feel bad about my list. So I'm like, okay, this isn't working. So I decided to feel gratitude, like literally physically feel. And for me, when I feel gratitude, it's like my heart is radiating. So for 20 or 30 seconds, I just felt grateful. And that's it, like morning and night. And then I am consciously practicing rewiring my brain to then unconsciously search for things throughout my day that I'm grateful for. And so I tend to look for that. I'm like, like just this morning, I was looking out my window, eating breakfast, going, wow, I've got a water view. I've got this great deck. I've got this great sun. Look at all the, and I was just like, so grateful for my home, like spontaneously, because I've practiced. Practice creates neural pathways. And once we rewire them and wire them and myelinate them and myelinate them and just make them stronger pathways into super highways, then we naturally come to it. We don't, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't always have to be conscious. However, I keep that practice up because I want to keep those neurons myelinated. How I see that is it's a three-step process. First, you know it, you understand it, and then you take action, you start doing it, and then you just become it. Yes, absolutely. No do be. Right. Yep. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Yep. And I would say aware instead of, you use knowing and awareness, because remember that knowing is that left frontal cortex, which has no connection to our limbic our emotional system so being aware oh this isn't working or this is what i want yeah and that actually will more quickly lead us to change than the knowing will okay the self-awareness is super powerful taking note <laughs> i'd love to wrap up the interview and so i have a few rapid fire questions for you okay i'm ready the first one being, besides your credo, what is a quote or motto that you live by? Oh, the one I mentioned earlier, how someone treats you is about them. How you respond is about you. So powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, and you dropped many of these, but what is a book you're currently reading or highly recommend? Oh, geez. Um, I read so many. My mind just went totally blank. Um, well, actually, this is a book I will read to the day I die, probably. Brene Brown's Gifts of Imperfection. It is the most powerful book for saying, you're human, it's okay. And she does a beautiful job at saying how human she is and everything she struggles with. So you're like, oh, if Brene Brown does that. I must be okay when I struggle with things too. It's just, oh, I just love the whole book. Okay. I, I do love Brene Brown. Yeah, me too. Final question for you. What is yeah. a piece of advice you would give your younger self? Hmm. It, that question um, brings tears to my eyes because it's such a, it's such a compassionate question. I would say, you know, you're okay. You may not realize it yet, but you will. You are absolutely lovable as you are. And I love you. And I'm always here with you. Such a powerful note to end on. Do Dr. Jane, thank you for joining me. 
Thank you so much for having me. I just love this conversation.